I find it very important and useful to look at this as if you were doing this problem in continuous time. You can then approximate the requirement in continuous time with discrete time if you want, but this gives some insight into the question that's being asked. If I make this continuous time, here is the measurement error, here is the model error. This is an action principle that we often learn about in mechanics classes or in books on calculus of variations. In order to get an extremum, delta A equals zero, it requires solving the Euler-Lagrange equations. Look at the Euler-Lagrange equations for this standard action. Here are the dynamics of the underlying model. Here is an additional factor due to the fact that this uh, dynamics is second order in time because it involves x dot squared. And on the right hand side, there's a term that comes from the measurement error, and this is nudging. Nudging comes directly out of the formulation of this, of the data simulation problem as a statistical physics problem. And uh, what can I say? There it is. The nudging, by the way, comes in an equation in which the boundary conditions are that the canonical momentum, namely the variation of the Lagrangian, the integrand here with respect to x dot, uh, is zero at both ends. And that's because we're calculating an average over a path, and we're varying all of the x's, and the condition that this be the correct equation requires this boundary condition, not ones that are often quoted in the literature. That answers a different question, but not this question. All right, this is a little story on how one can determine the global minimum of this action. There's a general theorem that says if you have a nonlinear function, it is an NP-complete problem to determine the global minimum. However, there's a little line at the end of the theorem that says in special cases you can do it, even though it's NP-complete for the general case. Well, we have a very special case here, and here's how we do it. If we were to turn this coefficient, Rf, which is the inverse covariance of the model error, to zero, then we're just left with a standard quadratic problem in the measurement subspace. We can solve that problem. We know what the global minimum of that is. That's trivial. And then by turning Rf, namely the quality of the model, on a little bit at a time, we can stay in the global minimum in an adiabatic way and track it as RF gets bigger and bigger. I'll show you how that works. Okay? And what I'm going to do now is show you the result of doing this on a Hodgkin-Huxley model, and then on a familiar model to many of you, namely the Lorentz 96 model, which you described, you assigned a bunch of students a few years ago not using the methods that I'm talking about, but using perfectly lovely methods, okay? All right, so I'm going to show you a plot of the action on different paths as a function of the logarithm of the strength of the model errors. Here's the simple model. This is Hodgkin-Huxley again. It has dimension four, and we can make one measurement. And where uh, the observation function is that we actually observe the voltage plus noise. All right, here's, here's the, this is a, a simulation. Here's the data. Uh, we do standard, we do annealing. Now, what does it mean to do annealing? What we do is we go to very small RF, uh, and we look at 100 different possible initial conditions on the action. And then we follow every one of them trying to stay in the minimum that we have found at Rf equals zero, which we slowly move along by improving the quality of the model itself. You can see that as Rf gets big enough, if Rf went to infinity, that would be deterministic dynamics, no model error, x equals f of x as a delta function. But you can see that as Rf gets bigger, some of the action levels go off and live up around here. Some of them come and live and, uh, uh, along a straight line here, 
which is a consistency check on the quality of the action level. If you take this path in this example, the path that gives the lowest action, it gives excellent predictions in the simulation for both the things that are measured, the things that are not measured, and all the parameters. So the voltage is measured. In red is how your estimated voltage tracks the measurement, and in blue is the prediction. These are the opening and closing variables for the sodium channel that tells you how much sodium can get in at a certain voltage and how much is restricted. We are not measuring them. We don't know them. There is no voltage. There is no ometer for them. Uh, but we get them accurately in the estimation window and in the prediction window. Similarly, for the others, I'll skip them. And you can look at this chart and see that we estimated this was approximately 20 parameters with great accuracy. We knew what they were, so we can compare them in a real laboratory experiment. We don't know what they are. Just to touch base with a familiar model to many people in the room, this is the standard Lorentz uh, 96 model. It's d equals 5. We've also done this for, for d equals 40, 100, 500. It doesn't matter, except that the graphics gets extremely complicated. Here's d equals 5. This is the action level, and this is the logarithm of the inverse covariance for the model itself. So when RF goes to infinity, the model error goes to zero. When RF is zero, the model error is uh, finite. What you see is a lot of states near uh, RF equals zero, and then the states, as you increase RF, grow, and then you have a very large number of minima over here, and this does not match the green line of consistency for only one measurement. What if you make two measurements? Well, you have one path, excuse me, yes, one path that meets the consistency measurement and a lot of other minima. The action of these other minima is larger than the action level here by a factor of 10 to the 3. Somebody calling me? I'm not here. Uh, and you can see that these contribute a very small quantity to the integral that you have to do, but they're there. And finally, if you go to three, me three measurements, you find that there's a single path that dominates. And why is it that when you have enough measurements, there's a single path? The underlying dynamical system in this case, which is just a toy model system, it's just an instructional model system, uh, is chaotic. The dynamics is unstable in its own state space. However, by making enough measurements, in this case three, you've probed the unstable space. You have an idea of how things vary along each of the unstable directions. You don't care where those unstable directions are. It doesn't matter. And you've been able to control them through the minimization of the action to give you a stable result. The stable result translates into a smooth convex surface for the action itself, which is what you want. All right, back to songbirds. All right, what do we know about songbird neurons? Well, quite a bit, actually. Uh, we know that it's not just sodium, potassium, this capacitance current, but it also involves calcium currents, which turn out actually to be extremely important in the Songbird system. This is our model. Whoops. This is our model. And again, here's our data. We take the model, we take our data, we form the standard model action, assuming that they're Gaussian uh, errors in the measurements and Gaussian errors in the model itself. This is the current and this is the responding voltage. Here what we see is for uh, an inner neuron, that's a neuron that modulates the activity without projecting uh, signals out to other parts of the uh, avian song system. And you see 
of course, you get an extremely good representation of the uh, voltage in the region in which you're making the measurements. You have no idea what the other variables are. They can't be measured. And you can see that you get an extremely uh, accurate representation of the um, uh, prediction as well in blue. That tells you that you have determined both the parameters in the model and the full state of the model, measured and unmeasured variables here at the end of the measurements, which is at about one and a half seconds, and you can predict. That means your model is good to go into a network model. Here's another example. And I think there's uh, not, a, not a third example. <clears throat> All right. Because I either have six hours and 27 minutes, or more likely six minutes and 25 seconds. Uh, I think we all are hoping for the second. <coughs> and I want to tell you how we use uh, data simulation methods in a related but rather different direction. The idea is the following. I said it earlier, but I want to say it again. Suppose we have constructed a model of, for example, how the song system works. In qualitative sense, the song system produces bursts of acoustic energy that we call syllables, just as when we speak or vocalize for communication, we produce bursts of acoustic energy called syllables. Between those syllables, there's a pause. The bird breathes. And there's another syllable. And there's a pause. And there's another syllable. The creation of those syllables and the syntax, the order, and the nature of the syllables is distinct to individual birds. It can be rather simple or it can be very complex. Suppose you have another problem in which you want to generate something called speech. Vocalization by the bird is speech. It's not any of the languages that any of us in the room speak, but it is the language that zebra finches or Bengalese finches or sparrows or thousands of other species of birds do speak. But you'd like to produce that signal not at the millisecond time scale or the hundred millisecond time scale of the collection of syllables that makes up a piece of information. But you'd like to do it at gigahertz. So you'd like to transfer your knowledge of what goes on in the actual avian brain into a silicon chip and then use that chip for whatever application you might want to use. It could, in fact, be for medical applications, or it could be for uh, giving instructions uh, in, uh, on a time scale, which is much, much faster than the way the bird has to respond. Think of an airplane pilot getting instructions on how to maneuver an aircraft, peaceful aircraft. All right. Here's the problem. You design the chip. And you send your design, beautiful design on a piece of paper. All the lines are connected, and this wire is connected to that. You send it off to a factory, and they send you back the chip. How do you know that they made it your way? How do you know that you got back what you asked for? So the first thing you do is data simulation on the chip to find out how it's, in fact, connected and what are the strengths of the connection. Second thing you do is you say, Wow, with this chip, now that I actually know what the chip is, because the specs that were given by the factory are whatever they told me, and I have no, no other way to check it except that, I can say, suppose I do a, a twin experiment uh, or a OSSE on my chip. So I say, OK, I turn the chip on, I give it some stimulus, and I measure the outputs of the chip. I can measure all of the outputs, and I can say, is there enough information in the voltage alone to determine whether or not this chip uh, is working properly? And finally, when you're satisfied that by measuring the voltage alone, if that's what you can measure, you can then take the chip and use it as the processing center for the data assimilation from real data. And that's what we've done. I'm going to show you uh, this chip. Uh, on the left is 
a representation of the neuromorphic chip. Actually, it's not a neuromorphic chip. It's just a piece of circuit board that we picked out of the lab and took a picture of. And on the right is sort of a bad picture of the bird brain uh, that I showed you before. That's just supposed to be cute. Okay? This is the part in which you test the chip. You ask whether or not by putting in a, a signal, which you know, you get out by adjusting the parameters on the chip, which you can adjust from outside the chip itself. In particular, you can adjust the links among the sections of the chip by an external, a ver very high speed bandwidth, high bandwidth communication link. And now this has tested how the chip actually works. And you can, uh, again, this is the estimation window and this is the prediction window. Uh, now we're testing whether or not by measuring only the voltage that comes out of the chip and not the other signals that represent how much sodium, how much potassium, how much calcium, how much whatever it is that you have. And so you've now done this twin experiment to test the uh, ability to do data simulation with the chip. And finally, this is the end of the uh, uh, cycle here. You have another current, another one of our currents that was designed. Uh, uh, and this is the testing of, uh, this is the ability of that chip to learn from the experimental data and produce good prediction. All right, that's it. But let me record what we learned. Everybody has to make a model. I don't have any better way to tell you a good model for coupling the human system with the ocean system and the atmospheric system than anybody else does. But you, you just got to face it. There's no button on this computer or any other computer that says make model. It's up to you. You're in business and you're not going to be short of a job for a long time. Okay. Secondly, what we've learned from doing this is make a big model. So in the case of neurons, but also in the case of some of the other biological examples that you hear over the next few days, add uh, properties that are biologically uh, plausible that may or may not be there. The data assimilation method will tell you that the channels that are there have a certain conductance, a certain permeability, which I'll call order one, and the things that aren't there have a permeability of order 10 to the minus 5. So you're actually able to prune a big model into a model which fits, is consistent with your data. Now you use these twin experiments to design the laboratory uh, experiments. I showed you a very complicated input current. You don't find those in mainstream neurobiology. What you find typically is a current which is zero, a step function to a certain voltage, and then off. Right? They don't actually work very well, but they're they're standard. Here what you do is you ask, what do you need to do to stimulate all of the degrees of freedom and to probe all of the parameters in the model? And that's what you can do here. Do experiments to determine the consistency of the model with the data, and then validate the model by doing predictions. Use Mr. Laplace's method and computable corrections to determine the consistency of those numerical methods. The standard model had Gaussian errors in the measurements and Gaussian errors in the model. The coefficient of the Gaussian errors in the model I called RF. It was the inverse covariance of those errors. As RF goes to infinity, you can prove by expanding around the solution to uh, 4D bar by the solution to delta A action equals zero that all of the terms in the expansion are small. To my knowledge, there is not a demonstration, I certainly wasn't able to do it, of what happens if you assume that you have a fat distribution instead of a skinny distribution for those errors. Take a Cauchy distribution, a power law distribution instead of a Gaussian distribution. One ought to check what those are because the tails may matter and certainly the accuracy of your ability to do the integral may matter. If there are not enough measurements, you have two choices that I know of. One is go get more measurements. In the case of numerical weather prediction, that can be extraordinarily expensive. 
just saying that is laughable unless you happen to have a few billion US dollars uh, ready to invest in various sensor uh, mechanisms. <coughs> but you can also use the fact, as I pointed out in the general formulation of the action, the fact that the measurements are not, in fact, independent. They depend on each other, and if they didn't, you could never get the model X, which satisfies the dynamics. So X at T minus 1 is F of X at T minus 1 is equal to X of T. You could never get that to match the Ys, the measurements. So there's information in the derivatives of the measurements, the second derivatives, and so forth. If you're living in discrete time, as we all do, uh, you can use, the, from nonlinear dynamics, the method of time delays to extract out that additional information. And finally, I just repeat the last item that I talked about using data simulation. You can actually go through all of the calibration, testing, and use of moving what you've learned about these systems. And there are many important things you can learn about the small systems, and when we get to bigger systems, we'll learn how to handle them as well. Uh, to put that in VLSI and use it for engineering purposes, and many other things that we probably haven't thought of yet. Thank you. <laughs>